Good morning. This is the Adult Sunday School lesson from Mount Vernon Baptist Church for August 23rd. We come this morning with requests for even greater prayer cover for those who are struggling with the virus. Our state is now at or near the top of new cases and the virus continues to rage among us. It also is within our church. We have church family who are struggling with the virus and we have courageous responders who are trying hard to battle it. Let's be much in prayer for those. Today our lesson is taken from Revelation 21 and a few verses out of 22 and it is called the new heaven and the new earth. The application is that the student will anticipate a new heaven and a new earth where the troubles of this world are ended and the worship and praise of God will last forever. Our verses today that come to us generally from chapter 21 and a few from chapter 22 read this way from God's word, starting in chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw, this is John speaking, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of the heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This verse is taken directly from Isaiah 25, 8, which foretells it. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It's done. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. Having the glory of God in her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And had a wall great and high, which had twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Skip down to verse 16. And the city lieth foursquare, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, twelve thousand furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. He measured the wall, a hundred and forty-four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. The building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Skip down, if you would, to verse 21. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each several gate was of one pearl, and the streets of the city pure gold as if it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did enlighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it, kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day and there shall be no night there and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie for they which are written in the lamb's book of life and then the first five verses of chapter 22 tells us and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river 
was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. May the Lord's word be blessed among us. Now we come near to the end of our study journey of the book of revealing of God's will for eternity. Here arrives the full good news of the gospel. As Jesus taught his apostles to pray in Mark 9, he first addresses the Father as hallowed, and then he instructs them to pray, Thy kingdom come. Now we study the filling of that ancient command. All battles are ended with the final and full defeat of evil and total victory of our Lord. All seals were open, all trumpets sounded, and all secret thunder judgments were finished, and vials of wrath are finally empty. The reason we studied 20 chapters was to better understand the plan, but more so to arrive at where we are now. And we should begin by understanding one most critical factor. None arrived at the place we study today who have not believed in the Messiah that was sent to announce it. A glimpse of this new kingdom was given us on the Mount of Transfiguration, but only a glimpse. Glory was seen slightly there, but now glory will be fully seen and never-ending everywhere. Immediately after the destruction of the armies of Satan and him being put forever into the lake of fire, John now sees a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the earth were passed away. Peter had foretold this event in Second Peter 3 when he told of the great change to rearrange both heaven and earth. And he quoted Isaiah 65 and 66 where we first received the promise. Fire will be the tool that God uses to renovate the earth and the atmosphere around it such that its surface shall be completely changed. The first change will be that all sin that has brought thorns, thistles, disease, and weakness shall have been removed. No evil shall remain, including any evil spirits. This is a great change. But it is not full destruction and new creation, but it is a full remodeling to prepare for a new city for all to enjoy. We know this from the wisdom of Solomon, as given to us in Ecclesiastes 1.4. Here's what he wrote. One generation passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. It has been specifically promised to us by Jesus in Matthew 5, 5, that the meek shall inherit the earth. And Isaiah 60 teaches that the children of Israel shall dwell in it forever. If God's people are to inhabit it forever, then it must exist forever. So this great change is a process of cleansing and purification to make the earth fit for the home of those who will live here after its renovation. This new earth and new heaven that will arrive will both forever be subject to our Messiah. The Holy Spirit speaking through Paul assures us of this fact in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Here's what the Spirit had Paul write. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, of things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All powers of evil are now removed. Since there shall be no more sickness or death, the air itself is changed, for no disease germs are spread there. Health will be preserved forever by the leaves of the tree of life. The earth will return to the glory of Eden. No thorns or thistles that came from the original curse will there be any more. All labor now will be a delight and not a chore. The earth will blossom. Paradise will be restored. Verse, <clears throat> verses 2 through 8 in chapter 21 teaches us that all things shall be now made new. The promise that was made to the overcomers in the letter that Jesus gave to the church at Thyatira is now filled. A new promise appears to be sure that all those who thirst shall be quenched by the water of life. 
This promise further excludes the presence of any who are fearful or unbelieving or who possess any evil in themselves. All of those are residing forever in the lake of fire, once more here described as the second death. A new relationship will now exist between God and man, as God will live with man, and there will once more be closeness, as was first seen in the Garden of Eden when God walked with man. A new condition arises where all tears are wiped away. No more death, sorrow, crying, or pain, as these will now all be considered former things. These things did remain inside the millennial kingdom as mortal men resided there. But now all mankind is immortal, and all these things no longer exist. Verse 5 assures that we will know these promises as John is carefully instructed, write them. Verse 7 reminds us that this new existence is the inheritance promised to all who believe. Again, the word overcomers is seen. We should be sure we fully understand this word. All those who are born again and thereby fully saved are overcomers. And saved people do not have to perform any other act to become overcomers. John had written in 1 John 3 that the love of God was bestowed upon us and that we were to be called sons of God. Now, in verse 7 today, the Lord reassures us of that relation when he says, I will be his God, he will be my son. Once we were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise in Ephesians 1.13, no power in the universe could alter or change that promise. A most powerful and magnificent view is given to John next for us in 21.9-27. through 27. He is approached by one of the angels who had poured out the vials of wrath and he's invited and carried away in the spirit to see the bride, the lamb's wife. John is taken away to a high mountain, and he sees a great city of New Jerusalem coming down from heaven, carrying the glory of God. John the Baptist told us in John 3, 28 through 30, that Jesus had a bride during his earthly ministry. And during the present church age, there's a similar relation between Jesus and his true church. In this new eternal age, the bride will be the redeemed, and the purpose of the thousand years was to bring them into this new eternal city. Together, forever, Jesus and his bride and his father will live with them, both Old Testament believers and New Testament Christians. The bride and the city are identical. The new Jerusalem is the home and the residence of the bride. Jesus himself promised this fact in John 14 too. This city is the place that he said he was going to prepare. This city is not heaven. It descends from heaven. It is approximately 1,500 miles square, 12 gates, three on each side that are never closed, each gate made of one pearl. The walls are of jasper stone with the foundation garnished with other precious stones. The foundation contains the name of the 12 apostles, and over the gates are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There is no sun nor moon needed to light the city. God will provide the needed light in himself. There'll be no night there in the city. It's a place of purest gold, so pure to be like clear glass. And verses 24 through 27 tell us that there will be nations on the earth outside the city who will bring the glory of their nations to it. But nothing will exist which could defile. All is now holy and eternal. Isaiah 9-7 foretold this time and said that of his government and peace there shall be no end. In verses 22-1, John sees a new river proceeding out <clears throat> of the throne of God and the Lamb. It's a life-giving river with its beginning at the feet of our Lord. And in verse 22-2, John sees a new view of the tree of life. It bears twelve fruits, and these shall heal the nations. In the beginning of our study journey, we saw in Revelation 2-7 that Jesus promised that the overcomers will eat of this tree, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In verses 22-3-4, John sees a new throne in place of the ancient curse, which will take the place of any need of a temple in the new city. Here people will actually see the face of God. 
and his name will remain on their foreheads. The whole new city will act as a forever temple because the tabernacle of God will be with his people. Heaven will have come down to earth, and this new city inside the new earth will have become the residence of God. While all these verses bring each of us great promises of eternal joy that awaits us in this city of God, we must keep in mind one thing. There will no longer be any need for time as we know it upon the earth. But each of us remembers that Jesus himself promised us this eternity, and we joined it the moment that we were saved. John 6, 47 is our proof. Verily, verily, I say unto you, says Jesus, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Our entry into joyful eternity began the moment our heart was drawn to him and became his. I hope to see you next week as we end this study journey of the Revelation.